Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this. I have to apologize. I have a very dry throat, so I'm going to have to hydrate every couple of sentences. Um, it was suggested to me that uh, by Bob that I might address the topic of neoliberalism and the university. And I have to confess that when I sat down to do this um, yesterday, I was overcome with a sense of being trapped in Groundhog Day. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it is the sort of same set of things over and over again. We're all very familiar, uh, in a sense, with its contours. It's a topic that's been studied widely, both in scholarly literature and in more publicly accessible commentary. And as I was uh, sort of sitting there thinking, well, how do I start this in a way that is original, an email uh, pinged uh, into my inbox. And um, it was from an entity called Modernizing Higher Education 2013 Conference. Um, and it's happening apparently on the 24th of September 2013 at the Barbican. And it begins with no preliminaries. And I, I'm not sure why, I was, um, why I've been selected for this email. I hope many more of you uh, have received it. It begins by saying, the higher education sector spends around 10 billion per annum buying goods and services. The sector actually saved 462 million in 2010-2011 through efficiency measures exceeding expectations. But is this enough? Will efficiencies deliver the improvements in quality and value required? Are you interested in how the sector can modernize itself, becoming more efficient and effective, in which case register for your place now? And um, there are three confirmed speakers. One is someone who's a director of policy um, at Universities UK. One is the director of International Exeter, the University of Exeter, and someone who's an academic lead for research at something called the Higher Education Academy. But it's the topics to be discussed that are interesting. First, competing in a global market. Two, strategies for change. Three, delivering value in a global market. Four, bet better use of estates and assets five future challenges and opportunities. And you will note that not one of those topics is on education itself. I think that pretty much uh, says uh, what there is to be said. But nevertheless, I'll, I'll go over some bullet points. And forgive me if this is all very familiar. Uh, I'll recap briefly the forms that neoliberalism has taken in, in the British context. The basic scenario is this, that higher education, which by definition as knowledge produced by human beings uh, for human beings, uh, is a resource which ought to be available to all who want it, uh, but it has become, like many other social responsibilities, directed towards the private sector, thereby very deliberately reversing the hard-won concessions and very real democratic victories of the last half century or so, uh, when the right to free education was extended across social and economic boundaries. Um, put simply, neoliberalizing the university entails bringing to higher education the principle that the market enables the highest expression of freedom expressed as economic choice, the heart of the idea, uh, which has also been rightly termed market fundamentalism. And this, in turn, requires restructuring the sector and individual institutions, which comprise it in specific ways. And I'll, I've tried to put four bullet points uh, together here. But they're non-exhaustive. The first is the partial and then eventually complete withdrawal of the state from the sector such that there will be nothing known as the public university or as the Brown Report put it when it got the uh, ball rolling properly uh, two years ago, three years ago now. There is, quote, scope for government to withdraw public investment from many courses, end of quote, with support for, quote, priority courses and the wider benefits that they create. But of course, what's interesting is that the wider benefits represent precisely a narrowing uh, of, of the intended benefits and the provenance of those benefits. So what you have, again, is the very familiar uh, strategy of um, uh, uh, deficit reduction as the, as the pretext for what is essentially an ideological project. And I think we, uh, as academics, we still too often talk about this in, in economic terms. You know, there's a budget and we have to do something with it and we have to be responsible within those terms. Uh, and we, we sort of assume that the economic um, playing field is, is what it is. The second bullet point is about the onus of funding, which now shifts to the student, redefined as customer, uh, as consumer. And as a corollary, academics become service providers and institutional competitors, this is quite important, uh, competitors with each other rather than scholars and collaborators. I remember suggesting to the head of research in my department that we actually boycott the REF when lots of people were complaining about it. Um, and I thought, well, if we're all against it, this is a, a good moment. Let's just, let's have Cambridge English boycott the REF. 
And he said, no, because um, you know, Essex or Sussex or Exeter will get the money. We can't do it. Um, so you know, that, that is actually, a, and, and of course it was sound pragmatics, but it is very much then participating in the logic of competition. Um, the, the other point that um, uh, Thomas spoke about is the, is the creation uh, of a massive consumer debt, uh, which leads to an indebted graduate population, which is left with no choice then but to participate in the speculative fictions of financial capitalism and to, in effect, be incapacitated in terms of resistance and finding alternatives to the dominant economic regime for the rest of their lives. Um, and then with the withdrawal of, of support for institutions in financial difficulties, the service provider, i.e. the university, can then sink or swim uh, in response to the pressures of competition and demand because the government will no longer be the lender of, of last resort. Um, at this point, the sector is potentially open to private companies to invest in or buy up failing institutions. Now, right now, the drums of full privatization are sounding in the distance, uh, but as we know, not least from the, the protests at Sussex quite recently, the backdoor privatization through the outsourcing of services has already begun. Now, this is all separate from profit generation, which may or may not uh, form phase two uh, of the project. And it is, of course, the logical trajectory of privatization. Unsurprisingly, the vacuum created by the slashing of university places immediately lured in for-profit private institutions offering degrees, which included BPP of Apollo Global and then the US-based testing company Kaplan. And, and David Willits hailed this move as, quote, the first glimmering of the opening of universities to supply side reform. So what you have then is the turning of the institution into a business, or at least for now, a pretend business, which in turn necessitates the growth of a large, and well, some would say bloated managerial class into which academics can be drafted and are drafted. Um, so uh, as my colleague Simon Jarvis puts it, neoliberalism entails replacing the welfare state by a superstition, which is that the market is then a providential mechanism uh, uh, to take care of these matters. And additionally, then business people are providers of universal wisdom. In some sense, they've replaced intellectuals as, be, as, 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 as a providers of, of wisdom, as it were, purveyors of knowledge. They are experts not merely in whatever it is that happens to have made them their own money, but also in how to uh, teach the ignorant and cure the sick. That's, that's Simon. So this is why you then have heads of corporations uh, uh, you know, routinely brought in as government advisors, uh, in addition to BP chief Lord Brown and top shops Philip Green. Um, and these are what Thomas Jefferson uh, uh, once described as the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations, which really gives undue and unelected uh, influence, which in turn undermines democracy and therefore the shape of knowledge itself very profoundly. And that is what we really need to be worrying about is what this does to knowledge uh, in, in the medium term. Um, it is important to remember that the construction of the fully neoliberal university which is underway is taking place in a larger landscape of punishing deprivation and the vitiation of democracy. The vast majority of young people in this country are at the receiving end of a class offensive, a, a, what is a class war, um, that has foisted an austerity regime upon those who can least afford it. Um, even the Department of Education recently conceded that the number of needs, people who are not in employment, education, or training is far too high, and over a third of pupils are leaving schools without basic qualifications most of them from low-income backgrounds. Um, and what happens is that with one in five young people out of work, we also have a generation of young people who will be in and out of poorly remunerated jobs for the rest of their lives. And this is also, the attack on universities is also about creating a very large service sector um, uh, and, and with many people in low satisfaction, repetitive, brain deadening and alienating employment. Um, and even if we take social mobility seriously, and it's a problem that I have, it's a term that I have problems with, but let's say uh, we take it seriously uh, for, for the moment, despite the promise that university places will ensure social mobility and a fair deal for the disadvantaged, uh, we know that two years ago, a quarter of English universities missed their access targets, and this was before the trebling of tuition fees. 
When the fees were pushed through without consultation and consideration, the government, you will recall, promised us that OFA would punish universities which failed to meet access agreements, including my own, um, and OFA promptly turned around and said they had absolutely no powers to do any such thing. This past week, we've had the Russell Group openly suggest that research funding be protected at the expense of the support for poorer students, which they swore so piously to protect when calling for the trebling of tuition fees. We've also heard for VCs calling last week again for the tuition uh, fee cap to be lifted. What makes all this infinitely worse is the claim that by doing all this, young people are being placed as the white paper had it at the heart of the system. That is, in being deprived of equality of opportunity, they are somehow being empowered. Um, and this is another feature of, of the neoliberal landscape, the uh, appropriation of progressive ideas and progressive rhetoric. And you can see this in, uh, in everything from the rhetoric of impact to open access to MOOCs or massive open online courses. It's the idea that you know, it's, it's all about the commons. It's all about creating a commons. But a, of course, what is happening is that like everything else that is, was once held as a resource in common, schools, industries, utilities, woodlands, libraries, universities, democracy itself, is going to become a feature of and uh, for and by the market. Because for all the talk then, uh, of choice and empowerment, when real democratic expression from below does emerge, it is met with alarm and threats um, and criminalization. Uh, so much as we want to put students at the heart of the system, when Tens of thousands of actual students in secondary school and college uh, during the autumn and winter of 2010, 2011 democratically and overwhelmingly peacefully voiced their concern and anger. They and their agency uh, were not welcome. The response to the very many peaceful occupations and protests was a vigorous, indeed vehement and vicious assertion of institutional and state power, ranging from legal notices, evictions, threats of expulsion, arrests, and exemplary excessive jail sentences. Uh, you will recall that Cambridge uh, sent down for two years a young man who read a poem when David Willits came to address us. Democratically engaged, educated, bright, assertive, and committed young people taught only to consume um, are needed, but um, we don't want uh, democratic participants. Um, and all, there's a sort of demonization of young people that's going on, um, and Thomas touched on this as well, constructing them as dangerous, liable to erupt at any time unless under constant threat and surveillance. And this is one of the features of our uh, political uh, present. You will be demonized, disciplined, and punished until you understand that everything in society, all human good, must be subordinated to the logic of the free, so-called free marketplace, what Barry Unsworth calls the sacred hunger for, for profit. Um, I'm going to uh, close now for, uh, by uh, talking about the academic response. Is it seven minutes? Seven minutes. Perfect. Um, and I want, what I'm about to say, I hope you will take in the spirit of, um, of me being somber um, and maybe showing a little bit of, uh, of the pessimism of the intellect as opposed to the optimism of the will that we all have to have. <laughs> um, and I, I think... Uh, I, I want us to be able to take on board the question of the role of academics uh, as a wider community in resisting or not resisting the onslaught of neoliberalism. Because although much unhappiness has been voiced in the secure confines of common rooms, seminar halls, and even journal articles, it is my sense that academics have not on the whole mounted a strong collective, and that's the word I'm underlining, resistance to these profound transformations of how higher education is envisioned and delivered. Because actually, with the exception of a handful who have been co-opted into bloated administrations and are going to retire on, on fat pensions off of uh, high six-figure salaries, um, I don't know anybody uh, who really, uh, who doesn't think that the present moment, which is turning universities into privatized corporate fiefdoms, uh, uh, isn't a bad thing. And yet the scale of uh, resistance in comparison to the depth of feeling is uh, relatively small. And we tried to get something very minimal done at Cambridge where we're still self-governing. Uh, there are lots of things that we could have prevented. We tried to prevent the tripling of, of uh, tuition fees and academics, not managers, academics voted it down. Um, we tried the m minimal measure of a no confidence uh, vote in Willits. Academics would not vote it through. 
Uh, apparently, it was a 50-50 uh, vote, uh, and I say apparently, but I won't, I won't um, go into that. Um, but, but the point is, this, even symbolic action is, is difficult, never mind, it seems to be difficult, never mind more than that. We were told that, well, we can't do this because remember what Thatcher did to Oxford, whatever that means. Um, I'm, I, I didn't study here, so, so I don't know. Um, so the real question I want to pose, which I suppose by definition is not applicable to anybody in this room, but I think it is a reality we have to engage with as we craft a vision and strategy for, for the sector, is the question of whether and there is a will in the sector and, and how strong it is, apart from a handful of people in each institution and a still relatively small group nationally, is there the will to fight a neoliberal onslaught? The limits of neoliberalism, just like the limits of any other system which seeks total power and domination, are prescribed by the limits of those who endure it and those who are asked to be complicit in it. And the truth, as I say, is it's not clear to me that there is a wider will among academics, particularly and ironically those who are in full-time and secure employment, to challenge these depredations. Power works through division and disaggregation. And on the ground, despite successful local actions, there has been insufficient resistance to these old tricks of division. And also, a fair amount of recoil at anything resembling direct, sustained, forceful, and concerted action. Uh, too much homage, I think, to the language of pragmatism, um, and certainly at my own institution, but I suspect elsewhere uh, as well, the sort of the high table model of, of how change gets done. You know, I'll have dinner with David Willits tomorrow and I'll drop a word or two in his ear. Um, and I'm not making this up. Um, and it, it may be, it may be that, con <laughs> um, it may be that concessions will be won, you know, little, little things here and there, but I, 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 I do wonder uh, whether we will ever put our collective body politic uh, between the neoliberal uh, assault and our, and our universities. Action, when it does emerge, is sporadic uh, and random. Um, in my own discipline, I've, I have wanted to think about the extent to which certain forms of postmodernism have been responsible for this. And I'm, again, I'm purely speculating, but there are certain fatal flaws which uh, appear to have hamstrung the humanities in particular and brought it close to defeat uh, in the battlefield. But another blogger, uh, uh, on the arts emergency blog calls it the failure of passive liberalism, the sort of willingness among academics to simply accept the cards that are dealt out by the government and fetishize one's own uh, disempowerment. And again, I know that there are many people who at great risk to themselves um, have stood up and spoken up, but I'm again talking about uh, us as a collective. So we do need to, I think, uh, reflect on this. And it seems to me that the challenge before us is to create what Pierre Bourdieu called the sort of the collective intellectual as, a, as a opposed to the lone intellectual, um, uh, and the intellectual in the sense of being oppositional and, uh, and con uh, con contestatory, contestatory rather than uh, acquiescent. Um, and I'll end with um, a quote from one of my favorite quotes from Frederick Douglass. He says, and I think this, this really does apply to academics, those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. But power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and never will. Stop there. Mm -hmm.